and welcome to Crimes Through Time. This is the second in a five-part series exploring the lives of the women of the Whitechapel murders. You can find the link to part one, Mary Ann Polly Nichols, in the description. The focus of this episode is Annie Chapman. Annie was born in 1841. Exactly when is unknown and her mother wanted it that way. Ruth Chapman was originally from Sussex and moved to London at 15, as many working class girls did, to take a job in domestic service. She met and fell in love with a charming soldier, George Smith, at the age of 22. He was stationed at the barracks at Portman Street, serving in the 2nd Lifeguards. The army at the time actively discouraged marriage, but at the same time encouraged monogamous relationships. This was in the hope of preventing disease in the soldiers from visiting ladies of the night. The sort of arrangement put the women involved with the soldiers in a precarious situation. They risked pregnancy outside of wedlock and the stigma attached to it. In early 1841, Ruth found herself in that exact situation. Annie Eliza Smith arrived later that year and within five months, Ruth was expecting their second she became what was referred to as a dolly mop, soldiers women that followed them when they were posted. Society regarded them as a sort of amateur prostitute, but the army took a more pragmatic approach. Ruth was given a job, most likely in laundry, and lived in a room close to the barracks for one shilling a week. Ruth and George were very much in love, and eventually, on the 20th of February, 1842, George was given permission by the army to marry Ruth. Their marriage was even backdated to 1840 so that Annie and her brother George William Thomas were made legitimate. The family could now all live together in the barracks. This involved finding a corner in the communal dorms. Men and women did all human functions in close quarters with appalling sanitation. I am sure it was a relief when they were able to move outside of the barracks in 1848. The couple built their family. Emily Letitia arrived in 1844, Eli in 1849, Miriam followed in 1851 and finally William in 1854. One of the biggest benefits of life on the strength or in the army was that all children attended the regimental school. These schools were set up to, quote, provide the means of making themselves useful and earning a livelihood, end quote. It was a fairly rigorous education, far better than the British schools most working class would attend. The afternoon lessons were called industry, and for girls this was all kinds of needlework to help them obtain work once school was complete. The Smiths never posted abroad, but they moved 12 times at short notice to addresses in London and Windsor. Annie learned to speak and comport herself properly to society's expectations. This stayed with her throughout her life. She always gave the impression she came from a good family. But her life would change in 1854. The family lived in 15 Raphael Street, with at least two other families, each occupying two rooms. Scarlatina, or scarlet fever, and typhus epidemics hit London, and in mid-May, both came to the Smiths. Miriam was two and a half when she sickened with fever, sore throat, flu-like aches and crying, and then came the rash, scarlet fever. She died on the 28th of May and buried the next day. William, aged five months, passed on the 2nd of June, Seven days later, five-year-old Eli was lost. George, the eldest, was 12. He would be diagnosed with typhus. He would suffer for three weeks before dying on the 15th of June. They were not allowed access to the regiment's doctor, but Ruth and George called the private doctors whose fees they couldn't afford. In three weeks, Ruth and George lost four out of their six children. Annie and Emily were the only two to survive. Scarlet fever and typhus were both incurable illnesses in the Victorian era. The loss of children was an unavoidable aspect of life, not that that matters to the family drowning in grief. 
Ruth and George would be blessed with three more children in time. Georgina in 1856, another Miriam Ruth in 1858, and on the 25th of February 1861, Fontaine Hamilton Smith would complete the family. Annie would leave the family home just before she turned 14 in 1856. Now that her education was complete, she would be expected to get a job and contribute to the household income. She had a position as a housemaid. In 1861, Annie was the housemaid for 67-year-old William Henry Lower, an architect and his brother, a retired stockbroker, Edward, living at 2-3 Duke Street, Westminster. She was the most junior, a maid of all work, carrying out general household tasks. She made around nine to 14 pounds a year with free room and board. For the first time, she had a room of her own. She would only have a day to a day and a half off a month. Interestingly, at 17 to 18 Duke Street lived Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the creator of tunnels, railways and bridges. It is likely the maids from all the houses along Duke Street would mix and be friendly. When Fontaine was born, George, Annie's father, began to realise his time as a soldier was coming to an end. George was considered to be a suitable candidate to become a valet to his commanding officers. In 1861, he started to valet for Captain John Naylor Leyland. When John decided to marry and resign his commission, he asked George to leave the second lifeguards and come to work for him. On the 19th of March, 1862, Trooper George Smith became Mr Smith, a month before his 43rd birthday. He settled his family in Knightsbridge, near to John's mansion, Hyde Park House. Just like Annie, George would see very little of his family, and without the company of his comrades in the army, he spent a lot of time alone. The job was full of opportunity. George would travel to Paris with his master, was on honeymoon, but also a lot of loneliness and this began to wear on George. On the 13th of June, 1863, Captain Leyland was acting as steward to the Denbyshire Yeomanry Cavalry Races in Wrexham. George had accompanied his master and was sharing a room at the local pub, the Elephant and Castle, with another staff member. He seemed to be his normal self and was, quote, quite cheerful, end quote. The next morning, between seven and eight, the staff member called him to remind him of the time. He replied, quote, it's all right, I'm not asleep, end quote. But he didn't move from bed. When he hadn't appeared an hour later, the landlady went up to rouse him to find George, quote, with his throat cut in a shocking manner with a razor lying by him covered with blood, end quote. George was dead when he was found. Later that afternoon, the coroners assembled and declared a verdict of, quote, suicide by cutting his throat with a razor while labouring under temporary insanity, end quote. Of course, what happened when Ruth and her children received the news is unknown. This would be devastating for the family, both emotionally and practically. George's pension expired with him. Widows were entitled to no support from the army. The family, now all women, Fontaine was just two, only had income from Annie and Emily's domestic jobs. Captain Leyland, deeply affected by his valet's passing, paid for the funeral costs and paid out the full quarter of George's pay. He also likely gave a lump sum payment to Ruth in order to save them from the workhouse. What Ruth did next speaks to the resilience of this brave woman. She returned to an address they had lived in 1851, 28 Montpellier Place. They took all three floors in the respectable lower middle class location. She set about renting her extra rooms to lodgers. With a good sized kitchen and scullery, she also set herself up to take in laundry for extra income. One of those lodgers would be John Chapman. It's just a coincidence that John had the same surname as Ruth's maiden name. There was no connection between the families. Born in 1844, John came from a family of horse keepers in Newmarket, Suffolk. He and his four brothers started out as stable assistants, receiving an extensive education in horse care. In 
Rising through the ranks, he became a coach driver, and in the late 1860s, he moved to London to further his career. During the time that John lodged at her mother's, Annie and John fell in love. They were married on the 1st of May, 1869, in All Saints Church in Knightsbridge. She had photographs taken to mark the occasion. They set up home at 1 Brooks Mews North. John was employed by wealthy families as a private gentleman's coachman. He earned between 35 and 80 pounds a year. The couple were very comfortable. For the first eight years of their marriage, John worked for a family in Onslow Square in St. James and, quote, a nobleman of Bond Street, end quote, a short walk from Buckingham Palace. Annie became pregnant and on the 24th of June, 1870, Emily Ruth was born and she was still very close to her family. She even returned home for her mum to help her through labour. In 1873, Annie Georgina was born she had photographs taken of her lovely girls. In the beginning of 1879, John was presented with an opportunity to become the coachman for Francis Tress Barry on his country estate, St Leonard's Hill in Berkshire. With it came the use of the coachman's cottage. The Chapmans had joined the middle classes. They had a reasonably sized house, good income, and he hired her own maid, and she had the use of a fly coach to run errands into town. Nine-year-old Emily Ruth was placed in a respectable young lady's school in Windsor. The estate boasted parkland and woodland that the family could enjoy, so beautiful it would host royal visitors, Edward, Prince of Wales, and Princess Alexandra. Annie's life was as far from Whitechapel that a person could imagine. So what went wrong? Hallie Rubenhold in The Five sums it up, quote, This might have been Annie's story in its entirety. It might have ended in a quiet middle-class comfort on a gentleman's estate. Their girls might have grown up and married middle-class men. The courses of all their lives might have ended quite differently had Annie Chapman not been an alcoholic, end quote. Her struggle was a lifelong one, according to a letter her sister wrote after her death. There was a suggestion that she had inherited it from her father. It began to numb the grief of losing her siblings and leaving her family home shortly after. In the Victorian era, alcohol was part of everyday life. Friendships were found and shared in pubs. There were women's saloons and it wasn't unusual for a lady to have a drink whilst out shopping. As a maid, her consumption probably felt normal, as she could fully carry out her duties. But there was a paradox to the social climbing most aspired to. Annie didn't work. Her children were at school, she had a maid to keep her home, and her husband was often away with work. All she had was time. Time to think, feel lonely, and above all, be bored. It was acceptable for middle-class women to resort to nipping, from a flask to keep away the melancholy feelings. By the 1870s, the concept of addiction to substances was accepted, but drunkenness was seen as, quote, an indication of a person's degenerate character, moral weakness and idleness, end quote. Annie would have been able to hide her addiction from the public at this time, but not from her family. The move from London might have been John's attempt to reduce her access to alcohol, but it just compounded her loneliness, away from her family and support system. The true cost of Annie's addiction was the tragic effects on her children. Emily, the couple's eldest, was healthy as an infant, but by eight had developed epileptic seizures. On the 5th of March 1872, Ellen Georgina was born, but lived just a day. 1873, Annie Georgina was born, with all the characteristics that we would now associate with fetal alcohol syndrome. Small wide set eyes, a thin upper lip and a smooth ridge that runs from the nose to the upper lip. This can be seen in her childhood photographs. On the 25th of April 1876, Georgina was born and lived until the 5th of May. Just before the move to the country, George William Harry was born in November 1877. 
he was sickly and died 11 weeks later. Mary and Lily arrived on the 16th of July, 1879. She lived 10 weeks, dying in October. On the 21st of November, 1880, John Alfred was born and he was paralysed. Even in the Victorian era, science had linked the excessive alcohol consumption with birth defects and death. Annie and her family would have been aware of this. Caring for a disabled child and the shame of blaming herself for the situation and an inability to control her compulsion to drink deepened her addiction. She was finding it increasingly hard to stay sober. To combat this, she went to visit her mum and sisters. They had all become Presbyterian and were teetotal. Emily, Letitia and Miriam had set up as dressmakers in their home, 128 Walton Street a road that ran to the back of the recently expanded Harrods department store. Miriam in her letter would say that it would be clear that Annie was wanting to give up drinking, but it was finding it impossible. Victorian society took the view that, in all circumstances, a person found themselves in was through choice, poverty, addiction, prostitution, or the result of a person being weak or lazy. Annie must have internalised this. Another devastating loss would send Annie straight to the bottom of the bottle. In November 1882, Emily Ruth, her 12-year-old daughter, began to sicken with meningitis. Annie could not deal with the loss of her daughter and was not at her bedside when she passed away on the 26th of November. Caroline Ellsbury, the Chapman's charwoman, tended to the dying child. It is unknown how long Annie was absent from the family, but her drunkenness had come to the attention of Windsor's police and magistrates. She wasn't a foul mouth or difficult drunk. She was, quote, deeply sad, quiet and heartbroken, end quote. The Habitual Drunkards Act of 1879 meant that alcoholics were to be rehabilitated rather than punished in prison. On the 30th of November, 1882, The day of Emily Ruth's funeral, Annie's sisters visited Spelthorne Sanatorium. On the 9th of December, she entered treatment there, committing to a year-long programme voluntarily. In line with the social view that addiction was weakness, most of the treatment was spiritual. Annie went through a daily routine of chapel, gardening, laundry, crochet and needlework, designed to keep the mind and body active. Once she showed progress, she enjoyed supervised trips to London, musicals and shopping trips. She responded well and was never recorded for bad behaviour. The last challenge was a home visit in November 1883, which she passed with flying colours. Returning home on December the 20th, 1883, Marion recalled, quote, She came out a changed woman, a sober wife and mother, and things went on very happily. End quote. Several months later, John suffered with a severe cold. He took a hot whiskey as a treatment. He kissed Annie goodbye and headed to work. The taste of alcohol brought on all her cravings. So strong they overpowered her resolve, and within the hour she had the bottle and was a quote, drunken madwoman. End quote. She was found drunk and wandering the estate. This was the last straw and John was issued an ultimatum. Annie had to leave or John would lose his job, which included their home. This would also result in no reference, making it impossible to get a job that would house and care for the family, in particular their disabled son. It is likely Frances Barry had paid for Annie's treatment at Spelthorn and it was meant to cure her and it clearly hadn't worked. Annie was devastated and her failure, quote, it was of no use. No one knew the fearful struggle. Unless I can keep out of sight and smell, I can never be free, end quote. She would never try again. The Chapmans agreed to split. This was a marriage built on love, and it would have been a heartbreaking choice for both. John agreed to 10 shillings maintenance. He was likely assumed that she would return to her mother and that they would keep her safe. She managed only a few weeks with them before striking out on her own.
All the reasons she drank previously were now compounded by her perceived failure, relapse and having left the family she loved. Like so many before and after her, Annie chose the drug of choice over her friends and family. She is still a long way from Whitechapel. All her ties were in the West End of London. What would make Annie move to the East End? Most likely a man. Just like Polly, Annie needed a protector. She met Jack Speavy in a local pub. They were both active in their alcohol addictions. He had links to the Notting Hill area and they became a couple for convenience. Annie felt her fall was unredeemable and society agreed. A female drunk, quote, was one who allowed their most brutal and repulsive penchant to come to the service and abandons herself to sexuality and becomes unsexed in her manners, end quote. A broken woman was considered the same as a fallen woman. Jack and Annie arrived in Whitechapel in the second half of 1884. She became known as Dark Annie because of her dark wavy hair, although now it was streaked with grey. She met the only friend in which she would confide everything, Amelia Palmer, when Annie and Jack moved to Dorset Street. These were some of the cheapest and filthiest lodging houses. She didn't need to live like that, but she chose to spend her maintenance in the pub. Amelia at the inquest would describe her friend as, quote, a very respectable woman, never heard bad language, but was straightforward. She was a very clever and industrious little body when she was sober, end quote. In December 1886, Annie's maintenance stopped. She got the news that John was gravely ill. Showing that Annie still loved John, she walked 25 miles in two days to return to Windsor to see him and her children. He had retired six months earlier from ill health. Annie did see John before he died on Christmas Day. He was nursed by Sarah Westall, an elderly family friend, and it was her that was present with him when he passed. John was just 45, but he was described as heartbroken, white-haired man. The loss of his wife had turned John himself to the bottle, and his cause of death was cirrhosis of the liver and dropsy. Amelia recalled Annie crying uncontrollably on her return to London. After John died, Annie gave up on life completely. She was dumped by Jack, leaving her without a protector. She briefly had a relationship with a man known as Harry the Hawker, but Annie was increasingly unhappy and in utter despair. Her physical health started to fail. By 1887, Annie began to suffer with tuberculosis, which at the time of her post-mortem was advanced and had begun to attack her brain. She was still being industrious, even if it was for beer money. She would make and sell needlework or sell matches or flowers. She even planned on acquiring work boots so that she could go to Kent for the hot picking season at the end of summer 1888. Annie was still in contact with her family, but she shared few details about her life with them. But they would still help her with clothes and little bits of money. She saw more of her brother Fontaine, but unfortunately he too had become addicted to alcohol. By summer 1888, Annie was in a steady relationship with Edward Ted Stanley. He was described as florist-faced and he worked at the local brewery. He was affectionately called the pensioner, despite being 45 years old. The couple would spend weekends together at Cressingham Lodging House at 35 Jorset Street. At her inquest, Timothy Donovan, the deputy keeper, testified that on Saturdays she would wait for Ted on the corner of Brusfield Street and they would go to the pub. The relationship was an exclusive one and while they were together, Ted paid for all their needs, shelter, food and drink. He would stay until Monday and leave enough money for Annie to stay until Tuesday. She would even wear an engagement ring, not a gift from Ted, but she wanted to give their relationship a sense of respectability. Annie's tuberculosis was taking its toll and once Ted left the lodging house on Tuesday, Timothy Donovan testified that she went to the infirmary at St Bartholomew's Hospital. In her possessions after her death, medication was found that confirmed this 
She most likely then slept rough rather than enter the hospital or workhouse as both meant no alcohol. We now come to the 7th of September 1888, Annie's last day alive. This timeline is pieced together from the testimony given at the inquest as reported in the newspapers. 5pm, Amelia meets Annie at the Dorset Street lodging house. She was sober but feeling ill. Amelia left and returned and Annie hadn't moved. She said, quote, It's no use my giving way. I must pull myself together and go out and get some money or I shall have no lodgings, end quote. 11.30pm, Annie returns to the lodging house and asks Timothy Donovan permission to go to the shared kitchen. 12.10am, she shares a pint of beer with Frederick Stevens, another lodger. She seems a little worse for wear with drink. 12.12am, William Stevens, another lodger, sees Annie in the kitchen. She tells him she has been to see her family and they gave her five pence. He sees Annie with a broken box of medication, most likely treatment for her tuberculosis, obtained from the infirmary. She leaves at some point and returns at 1.35am eating a baked potato. She goes to see Timothy in the office as she doesn't have bed money. They argue. Tim states, quote, You can find money for your beer and you can't find money for your bed. She retorts, Never mind him, I'll soon be back. Keep my regular bed for me. She would usually lodge at 29. She leaves, enter Paternoster Row towards Bushfield Street and then turns towards Spitalfield Market. Annie was resigned to a night sleeping rough. She headed to 29 Hanbury Street, a place often used for rough sleepers where she would curl up with her back against the wall. 4.45 a.m. John Richardson enters the backyard of Hanbury Street. He testifies to seeing nothing out of the ordinary. 6 a.m. John Davis, a car man who lived in the third floor of number 29 Hanbury Street, finds Annie's body. After alerting his neighbours, he goes to Commercial Street Police Station to alert the officers. Dr George Baxter Phillips was called to the scene. This is his inquest testimony. The left arm was placed across the left breast. The legs were drawn up, the feet resting on the ground, and the knees turned outwards. The face was swollen and turned on the right side. The tongue protruded between the front teeth, but not beyond the lips. The tongue was evidently much swollen. The front teeth were perfect as far as the first molar, top and bottom and very fine teeth they were. The body was terribly mutilated. The stiffness of the limbs was not marked, but was evidently commencing. He noticed that the throat was dissevered deeply, that the incision through the skin was jagged and reached round the neck. On the wooden paling between the yard, in question and the neck, smears of blood corresponding to where the head of the deceased lay were to be seen. These were about 14 inches from the ground and immediately above the part where the blood from the neck lay. He should say that the instrument used at the throat and abdomen were the same. It must have been a very sharp knife with a thin narrow blade and must have been at least six inch to eight inch in length, probably longer. He would say the injuries could not have been inflicted by a bayonet or a sword bayonet. They could have been done by such an instrument as a medical man used for post-mortem purposes, but the ordinary surgical cases might not contain such an instrument. Those used by the slaughterman, well ground down, might have caused them. He thought the knives used by those in the leather trade would not be long enough for the blade. There were indications of anatomical knowledge. He would say that the deceased had been dead at least two hours, and probably more, when he first saw her. But it was right to mention that it was fairly cool morning, and that the body would have been apt to cool rapidly from having lost a great deal of blood. There was no evidence of a struggle being taken place. He was positive the deceased entered the yard alive. A handkerchief was around the throat of the deceased when he saw it in the early in the morning. He should say it was not tied on after the throat was cut. The extent of her injuries were not apparent until the post-mortem examination. He noticed the same protrusion of the tongue. There was a bruise over the right temple one on the upper eyelid 
and there was a bruise, and there was two distinct bruises, each the size of a man's thumb, on the fore part of the top of the chest. The stiffness of the limbs were now well marked. There was a bruise over the middle part of the bone of the right hand. There was an old scar on the left of the frontal bone. The stiffness was more noticeable on the left side, especially in the fingers, which were partly closed. There was an abrasion over the ring finger with the distinct markings of a ring or rings. The throat had been severed as before described. The incisions into the skin indicated that they had been made from the left side of the neck. There were two distinct clean cuts on the left side of the spine. They were parallel to each other and separated by about half an inch. The muscular structures appeared as though an attempt had been made to separate the bones of the neck. There were various other mutilations to the body, but it was of the opinion that they occurred subsequent to the death of the woman and to the large escape of blood from the division of the neck. The deceased was far advanced in disease of the lungs and membranes of the brain, but this had nothing to do with the cause of death. The stomach contained little food and there was not any sign of fluid. There was no appearance of the deceased having taken alcohol, but there were signs that she had been badly fed. He was convinced that she had not taken strong alcohol for some hours before her death. The injuries were certainly not self-inflicted. The bruises on the face were evidently recent, especially around the chin and side of the jaw, but the bruises in the front of the chest and temple were of longer standing, probably of days. He was of the opinion that the person who cut the deceased's throat took hold of her by the chin and then commenced the incision from left to right. He thought it was highly probable that a person could call out, but with regard to an idea that she might have been gagged, he could only point to the swollen face and the protruding tongue, both of which were signs of suffocation. The abdomen had been entirely laid open, the intestines severed from their attachments and had been lifted out of the body and placed on the shoulder of the corpse, whilst from the pelvis, the uterus and its appendages, with the upper portion of the vagina and the posterior two-thirds of the bladder, had been entirely removed. No trace of these parts could be found, and the incisions were cleanly cut, avoiding the rectum and dividing the vagina low enough to avoid injury to the cervix uteri. Obviously the work was that of an expert, of one at least who had such knowledge of anatomical or pathological examinations as to be enabled to secure the pelvic organs with one sweep of the knife, which must therefore have at least five or six inches in length, probably more. The appearance of the cuts confirmed him in the opinion that the instrument, like the one which divided the neck, had been very sharp character. The mode in which the knife had been used seems to indicate great anatomical knowledge. He thought he himself could not have performed all the injuries he described, even without a struggle, under a quarter of an hour. If he had done it in a deliberate way, such as would fall to the duties of a surgeon, it would probably have taken him the best part of an hour. Annie died in the middle of Polly Nichols' inquest, and the deaths were quickly linked. The investigation already had a fixed position. This was the work of a prostitute killer. On all of Annie's forms, her occupation was recorded as prostitute. Commissioner Charles Warren had issued orders on the 19th of July 1887, stating, quote, The police are not justified in calling any woman a common prostitute unless she identifies herself as such or is convicted. Although a police constable might be convinced in his own mind that a woman is, there must be witnesses and evidence to attest to it. End quote. Annie was never arrested or cautioned for the solicitation. The police, despite their best efforts, could not find a single witness or any evidence that Annie had ever worked in the sex trade. Facts did not deter the newspapers, with the star declaring, quote, We are able to see the kind of existence that women of Chapman's unfortunate class are compelled to live probably. She did not rise until the shades of night enabled her to ply her hideous trade and she then seems to have spent her time passing from liquor shop to liquor shop with the fitting companions, male and female, of such orgies. End quote. On the 8th or 9th of September, Annie's siblings were notified of Annie's death.
They didn't tell their ageing mother or Annie's now orphaned children. It fell to Fontaine to identify his sister in the morgue. He also testified at inquest on behalf of the family. Annie was laid to rest at a very private ceremony on the 14th of September 1888 at 9am. There were no mourning coaches. The family met her at the City of London Cemetery. The funeral was kept secret and only her family attended. Fontaine had a breakdown under the strain, stealing from his employer to fund his drinking. He abandoned his family and disappeared into the bottle, but he handed himself into the police in Gloucester one week later. He came back to London and was tried at Marlborough Street Magistrates Court. He was sentenced to three months hard labour at Millbank Prison. On release, Fontaine and his family moved to Texas for a fresh start. The part of Annie's story that I find the most frustrating and yet the saddest is that she didn't need to be in Hanbury Street that night. She was a much loved lady with a bed waiting for her in her mum's, her sister's, her brother's. She could have entered the infirmary to tend to her health or even the casual ward. But the addiction for which I have so much compassion was just stronger. Again, Hallie Rubenhold says it best. Quote, what her murderer claimed on that night was simply all that remained of what the drink had left behind. End quote. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and let me know what you think of this case in the comments below and I look forward to welcoming you in the next one. <music>